Before this video begins, I would like to give a quick thank you to my Asbantium level patrons Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Hello everybody and welcome back to another Doctor Who lore video where I go through every episode of the modern series and focus on the lore of something notable from those episodes. Now since we're at the episode Dalek, you were probably expecting this video to be all about the Daleks themselves, but you know, good luck finding anyone actually willing to make an entire history of the iconic villains who have the most inconsistent timeline of like any villains in any media ever. Instead when it comes to series 1, I love how so many characters have deep backstories and histories fleshed out in expanded media or tie-in material. Materials. One of my favourite examples of this is Henry Van Staten, the arrogant billionaire owner of the Metaltron Dalek. He was always a fun antagonistic character, but there's actually a lot more to his story than we see on screen, including what happened to him after the events of the episode. So watch out for spoilers for the Dalek novelisation, and without any further ado, this is everything you need to know about Henry Van Staten. Bring him in, let's see him, and tell Simmons I want to visit my little pet. Get to it! We don't know exactly when Henry Van Staten was born, although the Dalek novelization claims he was 53 when the events of the episode take place. Using some quick maths, that means he would have been born around 1959. Henry was the son of Edward Van Staten, the billionaire founder and owner of the Van Staten Corporation, which was a business specialising in arms dealing and oil during the latter half of the 20th century. Oh, so you know, I, I guess they'd fit in perfectly as you know a football club owner in the 21st century. Despite the success of the company, Edward and Henry had a very strained and distant relationship because Edward would always be away on business trips with Russian bankers during Henry's childhood. Again, you know, they were perfect for buying a football club. Henry was forced to spend his childhood in isolation in a housing complex within the Utah desert. The novelization explains that Henry was left in the care of Otto von Donitz, who worked for Edward and was tasked with educating and caring for the billionaire's son. Henry and Otto became close, and on the kid's seventh birthday, Otto bought him a telescope under the pretense of it being a gift from Edward himself, so that Henry could demonstrate his ambition to a one day reach the stars. However, when Edward found out about this, he was furious because he thought staring at the stars only made people think things couldn't be achieved. Therefore, he fired Otto and had the telescope destroyed to teach his son a lesson. Just billionaire problems, I guess. By Henry's 15th birthday, which would have been around 1974, his father was dying of an unspecified disease, so he gave his son a small gift of one million dollars. You know, just a little bit of pocket change to help get Henry going and learning the values of hard work. It's not been easy for me. My father gave me a small loan of a million dollars. Edward hoped his son could prove himself worthy of running the Van Staten Corporation after his death. However, rather than investing this small sum of money into oil and arms dealing like Edward wanted, Henry instead instead used the economic knowledge he'd gained from Otto to invest in telecommunications and the internet, which were both emergent industries around that time. Naturally, Edward was frustrated about this apparent waste of a small fortune, but he still reluctantly signed the corporation over to his son rather than his own lawyers. Henry had assured him that his skill in investing would ensure Edward's name would survive beyond his death, with these assurances convincing Edward that his son was the only one skilled enough to take over the corporation from him. Henry Van Staten then took over the Van Staten Corporation and the change in direction to communications proved to be incredibly successful for the company. When his father eventually succumbed to his illness, Henry made all his workers mourn Edward for 10 minutes, just to then fire them all so he could rebuild the corporation from the ground up to achieve his dream of reaching the stars. Or at least, you know, bringing the stars to himself by seeking out and collecting alien artifacts. I wanted to touch the stars! You just want to drag the stars down and stick them underground! In 1999, Henry Van Staten Staten renamed the corporation Geocomtex, which was founded to tackle the Y2K bug. This was a big scare leading up to the year 2000, where computers weren't able to tell the year 2000 apart from 1900, which caused a few issues regarding like banking and bills and stuff like that. It was just like a minor issue that IT had to deal with. Although according to media sensationalization and misinformation, the whole world would explode on New Year's Eve and the planet's population would face a post-apocalyptic nightmare with no food and no water. Naturally, you know, that didn't actually happen, but Geocomtech still became a hugely successful and influential corporation, eventually using scavenge technology from the Roswell crash to develop broadband and scrape in a Russian crater for the cure for the common cold, although Van Staten kept it secret from the public so he could make more money. Oh, I am so gonna patent this. So that's your secret. You don't just collect this stuff, you scavenge it. 
it's notable that there was actually a real Geocom text website created as a tie-in for Doctor Who Series 1, which gives us a nice window into how the fictional company operated. They stylized themselves as being a company that loves you and a company you can rely on. Their website reads, we like your life to be simpler. We like to be in control. You know, definitely not a red flag there especially since they secretly owned the entire internet. The website also lists some of their products, including IE core chip transistors, bubble memory, ether beam sensing technology, and bonded polycarbon. There's also an FAQ page, which is full of techno babble like flange differentials, discotron threes, and finkel groovers. Lastly, the website boasts that the company makes the best computers in the world, which never break down, along with the best internet access, which is swift and never goes down during the download of files. Indeed, by 2012, Geocomtex was the world's leading electronics company and even provided security system software, so it really was a juggernaut in the industry by the time we meet Van Staten in the episode, essentially generating infinite money for this increasingly narcissistic and erratic billionaire. The 13 years after Geocomtex's establishment saw an even wealthier and more egotistical Van Staten building up his collection of alien artifacts. He even gave an interview to Mickey Smith, who is Doctor Who website in 2006 after the Slithian invasion, and offered Geocomtex products as a prize for the reader with the best reason for wanting to meet an alien. This interview gives us a few indications as to what Van Staten was like at this point in his life along with revealing that he grew up watching Star Wars and dreamed of being an astronaut and going to Mars. Henry was an outspoken public believer in aliens, and how often they had come to Earth previously. The first part of his collection was a bit of moon dust he had come across at an ammo fair, but he then began to use his Geocomtex wealth to build up his collection by trading on the so-called grey market. This collection included things like unidentified scraps of metal, a hugely heavy lump of rock the size of a Jolly Rancher, and his underground vault in Utah housed things like a side Cyberman head, the mylometer from the Roswell crash, the arm of a Raxacrocophalopasaurian, a xenomorph egg, various meteorites, an ape man head, a giant beetle, an earth reptile head, and an alien lizard. The stuff of nightmares reduced to an exhibit. I'm getting old. However, the most prized possession of Van Staten's collection would come into his ownership in 2012, around the time of his 53rd birthday. When he had turned 45, Henry decided to finally acquire a living alien specimen rather than just bits of dead ones. According to The Secret Lives of Monsters, Van Staten bought the Metaltron at a private auction over the internet, which required a million dollars just to access. However, the Dalek novelization claims he tracked the Metatron down to Hiram Duchesne, the American CEO of an ice cream company. Hiram had grown up as a middle class businessman and he was able to secretly buy the Metaltron which had crashed on Earth in the 60s, after having fought the War Doctor during the fall of Arcadia in the Time War. The Metatron had been part of many different collections since it crashed on Earth, always managing to escape the hands of UNIT who were desperate to own the so called Code D, although their interest only ever seemed to heighten the price of the Metaltron. Henry Van Staten was desperate to buy it off Haram, offering him $25 million only to be refused. This led to a furious Van Staten and buying out the other man's company entirely, hoping to force him into accepting the money he now desperately needed. Despite being bankrupted by this, Hiram still wouldn't budge. However, when he discovered he had cancer, he reluctantly agreed to sell the Metatron to Van Staten after hearing rumours Henry scientists had developed a cure using alien technology. As Van Staten's eight-year quest finally came to an end and he was able to at last own a living alien specimen, Hiram mocked Van Staten and left him with a lasting dare to make the creature talk. I am Henry Van Staten, now recognize me! After securing the Metaltron, Van Staten became a bit of a recluse, spending almost all of his time at his vault. This was a private museum near Salt Lake City, Utah, 53 floors below the surface. Anywhere from 200 to 400 people worked at this vault. These included Adam Mitchell and his roommate Sven, who was replaced by Adam and had his memory wiped before being sent off to Scandinavia, despite him being from Switzerland. There was also Aaron Denton, who suffered from extreme headaches only curable by inflicting pain upon others other living beings. He agreed to work for Van Staten in exchange for being freed from prison, and he gave himself a new identity, naming himself Danny Simmons after a child he had attacked in school and later killed. So, you know, Van Staten only works with the best people, you know, trust that recruitment ad on their website. They, they really want the best. 
Lastly, for the significant characters in the vault, there are Owen Bywater and Diana Goddard. According to the Dalek novelization, these two were actually undercover FBI agents in a relationship with one another. Bywater was from Chicago with Irish ancestry and became security commander in the vault, while Goddard started off as a guard and rose to chief of staff when the impulsive Van Staten took a liking to her. The book reveals that Goddard joined the FBI after being inspired by her dead cop father and she wanted to make the world a better place, uncomfortable with working for Van Staten even even if it was undercover. The FBI were investigating Van Staten due to his influence on the world stage. After all, he'd grown so rich and powerful that he was able to dictate the outcomes of elections and replace the President of the USA on a whim, like we see at the beginning of the episode. The president is 10 points down, I want him replaced. I don't think that's very wise, sir. Thank you so much for your opinion, you're fired. In the Dalek novel, Goddard places Van Staten under arrest after the failed ambush against the Dalek. But obviously, this conflicts with what we see in the episode itself. The novelization also sees Van Staten wipe his own memory after the Dalek shows him a vision of brutally killing everyone he had ever harmed. Van Staten then mentally regressed to an infant, with Goddard arranging to take care of him in the state he was in. However, the episode sees a more ruthless Goddard usurping Van Staten entirely and willingly wiping his memory like he himself had done to others. To the general public, this eccentric billionaire simply disappeared under mysterious circumstances, with the book The Doctor His Lives and Times showing he was dumped in the Californian city of Sacramento. Henry Van Staten will be a homeless, brainless junkie living on the streets of San Diego, Seattle, Sacramento. On the 2nd of May 2012, Van Staten was accosted by police at Riverside Boulevard in Greenhaven for causing a public disturbance in the early hours of the morning. He was described as being a homeless, brainless junkie and refused to cooperate with the officers cautioning him and he just repeated, don't you know who I am? over and over again, clearly showing he had some lingering memories of some kind to his previous life. One of the officers involved with the information bulletin noted that this unnamed vagrant looked a bit like Henry Van Staten, only to be mocked and denied by another officer. This was the last known appearance of the billionaire who once owned the internet itself and it was a very humiliating end for such an arrogant and ambitious character. Take him away, wipe his memory and leave him by the road someplace. You can't do this to me! I am Henry Van Staten! So, that's the story of Henry Van Staten, who so desperately wanted to touch the stars that he brought them to him, only to pay the ultimate price by getting almost 200 people killed by his prized possession and being dumped in Sacramento with no memory. All this expanded media paints a pretty bittersweet and almost tragic picture of Van Staten. He was a child who grew up without a dad, growing up dreaming about being able to meet aliens or reach the stars he loved to look up at. However, he allowed ruthlessness and selfishness to consume him as he sought to own everything, losing sight of the inspiration a small little telescope had once given him. It's fascinating to see how well expanded media fleshes him out and his company, giving us a much more layered understanding of his personality and why he acts the way he does throughout the episode and the novelization. Like I said with Clive, it's great how we get to learn so much more about these random side characters and what led them up to the point we meet them in the episode, giving them an entire life of their own and reminding you that yes, these are individual people with their own pasts and full backstories. So, that being said, I hope you liked this video or at least learned something new about Henry Van Staten, whose prestigious vault was filled with cement and left to be forgotten about, only living on in the artifacts stolen by people like Adam Mitchell and Lady Christina D'Souza. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time when we talk about Doctor Who's Forgotten Companion. Bye bye. Adam was saying that all his life he wanted to see the stars. Time to go and stand outside then. And I'd just like to thank my Asbantium level patrons, Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson, my Diamond level patron, Glenna Clark, my Platinum level patrons, Maximilian Foreman and Nick's Games, and all my Gold level patrons, Boots, Daniel Shiloto, Franz Orn, AK Line Vortex, Robert Hock, and Tom Azar. Thank you so much for your support.